Hi, my name is Catherine Fleming. Um, very excited to be here. Those were two, uh, two amazing talks. Thank you guys so much. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that I have done in the past um, that has sort of led to my realization that I was really interested in materials and sustainability. And when I think about sustainability, I don't just think about um, the ecological effects of it, but something that's really important to me is the cultural sustainability of craft, because it's a living thing. Um, so when I was growing up, uh, TV nature documentaries, like Wild America, I know you guys are British, so think David Attenborough, but American. Um, <laughs> were a huge influence on me. Uh, this is Marty Stauffer, and when I was with Marty, um, I felt like new explorers must have felt when they discovered species for the first time. I was awed, and I was thrilled, and I was filled with wonder. Um, and my work on, on many different levels is about how we interact with nature and the potential for design to shape the encounters that we have with it. Uh, so this is a cave painting from uh, Lescaux Caves in France. It's from 40,000 years ago. Um, but what I find amazing and, and wonderful about it is that it depicts animals. And it's one of the first known human artworks, um, which to me means that people have always been looking towards animals. And these are animals that these people really looked at, and they, and they describe them in detail. You can see bison that are molting in summer, and you can see uh, woolly rhinos with a skin flap. Um, not in this picture, but in the rest of it. And uh, one of my favorite authors, Mary Midgley, says that we're not just like animals, we are animals. And how we see ourselves in relation to them uh, is really how we define ourselves. Um, so animals have abilities that far exceed our own, and they also produce materials that are far superior to anything that we could create. Um, so this is the golden fleece. It's um, from the myth of Jason and the Argonauts. And basically, this, this fleece was um, supposed to have curative powers. And one of the heroes of the myth had to go and steal the fleece. And um, he was a hero. Uh, but um, one of the interpretations of this myth is that it was actually a way to explain having sheep husbandry come um, into Europe from the West. And uh, for me, it's also an example of how linked animals are to our survival as well as our imaginations and what we think is possible. So this is a Chiru antelope. Um, they live in the Tibetan plateaus at about 4,500 4, meters above sea level. Um, and we've scoured the globe looking for animals that have um, materials with incredible properties. It happens that the Chiru antelope produces um, a very, very fine fiber, which is finer than cashmere. It's, in fact, the finest naturally occurring animal fiber on the planet. Um, it's about the fifth of the size of human hair, and it's incredibly warm. Um, so this, to me, is almost the real golden fleece. Um, so it's just another quick example. Sorry, I am um, very inspired by nature. Uh, so this is a bird of paradise. I don't know how many people have seen birds of paradise. Um, but birds of paradise involve, evolved in Papua New Guinea, and they didn't have any natural predators. And so they put all of their biological resources into um, developing behaviors and materials that, um, to attract mates. It was all about beauty and, and sexual selection. So this is his other move. Um, but what I think is amazing about this, uh, not only the behavior, but the feathers themselves, um, these don't have any pigment in them. They are completely structurally colored. Uh, so the way that the light refracts on the structure of the feather is what creates the orange-yellow shift versus the green-blue shift, which this animal uses to its advantage in this display. Um, but today, there are few spaces or, or creatures left on the planet that um, aren't discovered. Uh, in fact, I think the challenge of today is about um, managing those and conserving those that we already have. So this is a, a whooping crane conservationist. His name's George Archibald. Uh, he brought the whooping crane back from near extinction. And here he is actually dancing a mating dance uh, with this whooping crane to try to encourage it to lay eggs. 
Um, unfortunately, he imprinted on the crane, and so the modern day conservationists wear these uh, crane costumes that they interact with, cranes with uh, hand puppets. Uh, so, while wild animals like the whooping crane may have evolved through natural selection, um, they survive or they go extinct today because of human selection. Um, and with a projection of the nine million species on Earth, um, half of them are meant to go extinct by the end of the century, I think we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to try to imagine a world that doesn't have wild animals? So, my work, tries to imagine a, a different future, and rather than preserving and, and conserving nature, I wonder how we can evolve it to mean with us. Um, this grizzly bear specimen in the Museum of Natural History uh, in New York is one form of natural preservation, and um, on the right is a uh, pizzly or a growler bear, which are um, hybrids of grizzlies and polar bears, which are occurring more frequently as um, polar bears are getting forced south because of climate change. So this is nature's evolution um, and adaptation, but I wonder if we can also force evolution or shape evolution um, to make something that's as beautiful and amazing as this. Uh, so we already kind of do this. This is uh, Shrek the sheep. Um, this is what happens to sheep when you don't shear them. We've actually evolved them to the point that they don't stop growing fur. In fact, the um, leading cause of death in sheep is lack of shearing. Um, they get infected and anyway, this one survived because he was really at high altitude so there were no flies or anything, but um, you know, we, we, we already participate in this activity. But um, today, we know more than ever before about uh, evolutionary mechanisms. Uh, we discovered that there's a bodybuilding set of genes um, that means that the same genes cause development across species. The same gene that a fly has that causes the development of the eye is the same gene that causes the development of our eyes. There's other genes that determine the division of their fingers and their toes. Um, Spider silk, Oops, sorry guys, I'm gonna skip through this part. Uh, so biotechnology provides tools um, that allow us to regulate the assembly of these genes in new ways. And for me, it doesn't just mean exchanging bits of DNA, um, but it's the possibility for entirely new taxonomies and ethologies and whole kingdoms of nature and potential interactions that we have with the natural world. So I think that we can imagine a different future, and um, in my ex work I explore a little bit about what that future might look like. So in nature, orchids chemically communicate um, with insects and with each other, um, and so they can perceive pheromones, and humans also, in some, according to some, produce pheromones. So could an uh, orchid develop the ability or be engineered to have the ability uh, to detect human pheromones? This prototype of new orchid um, indicates the ovulation cycle of females living in close proximity. Um, so it's, it's not just beautiful, but through its bloom cycle, um, it becomes an active influence on human sexual and reproductive behaviors. And I think that's a, a new type of interaction. Um, so that's some flora, but in terms of animals, most of us encounter wild animals for the first time through zoos, and zoos have become these institutions of conservation. Um, they have software that optimizes breeding in order to maximize genetic diversity amongst different species and ensure their survival into the future, but without a natural habitat to return to, how do we decide what's, what's natural for them? And at that point, what are we actually conserving? Uh, so these are some experiments that I did, just imagining um, what it would be like uh, to not preserve animals as artifacts of a wilderness that doesn't exist anymore, and um, evolving them to live in the world that we're creating. So this is a sheep in a lavender farm and a horse in tulip farm. Um, so I wanted to know, like, could we redesign the zoological park to celebrate the evolutionary potential of animals? 
So welcome to Regent's Park of Evolution. Um, in Regent's Park of Evolution, it's a huge expansion of the old London Zoo. Um, take over all of Regent's Park and showcase a new model of human-animal interaction. Each species in the park is designed to give visitors the experience of encountering um, wild animals. So this is uh, the superbivore. Uh, the species scales the vertical rock formations in the um, northwest corner of the park. And it has the neck of a giraffe and the balance of a goat. And it can walk out onto tightrope wires into the forest canopy. And that's where it uses its combination of horns, antlers, and ossicones to rake through the forest canopy and harvest the fruit there, which then spirals down its horn. This is uh, the retro-reflective carnivore. They patiently track the superbivores from an island they live in in the center of the park. They're a new breed of hexapetal predator. That means they have six legs, and they also have adaptations that were formerly only seen in cats or dogs. And um, they don't hunt by stealth, but small muscles running along their spine allow them to twitch their hair and play with the refractive properties of their fur. And this actually becomes a spectacle um, and stuns the superbivore like a deer in headlights. And finally, this is the beaked porcupine. Um, they live in the northeast corner of the park and what appears to be a perfectly manicured garden. Oops. Um, sorry. What appears to be a perfectly manicured garden is actually the result of a symbiotic relationship between the ants that create the rolling landscape here and the beach porcupine that camouflages itself in the tree, um, or in the, yeah, in the tree. Uh, so these are just some potential flora um, and fauna that, um, I designed to begin to ask if we could become creators and discoverers in our, in our own future wilderness. Um, and by building these prototypes, um, I want to blaze trails into an evolutionary future where we can harness the endless potential of biology and create future life forms, um, materials, that are most beautiful and most wonderful and can continue to evolve. So, I made this project. I studied with a taxidermist. I learned taxidermy and I created these models of animals. It was really interesting um, to learn about where you source taxidermy materials from. Um, in any case, I created this project and I had no idea that um, I would get a lot of reaction from it. Um, in fact, the the editor, the writer at The Guardian said that if I really truly meant this as a sincere design proposal that it was um, wicked and no one's ever called me wicked. Um, but I really wanted to look at like at, at natural history and, and science and taxidermy as being a conveyor of that kind of information and turn it on its head by looking at the way that we could see it through the lens of biotechnology um, and using design with biology as a medium. Um, so just real quick before I get on to my work at Adidas. Um, I think there's a lot of different possible futures when you think about biology and technology and design. Um, there's, this is a futures cone, so it's looking at um, potential over time for technology and biology and design to evolve. And, and I feel like um, what's important here is that we have to go through the process of imagining a technology and how it will evolve, but ultimately, um, we have to concede the importance of um, imagination and, and vision. And um, it's not just about the outcome of the technology, but it's about the experience of the technology. And we have to be able to shape it um, in the way that we want, as opposed to technology shaping us. Um, so today, our, our product landscape is um, super homogenized. In the industry I work in, we ship materials all over the world. We ship products all over the world. Sometimes we ship them to one side and then we ship them back. Um, we manufacture at the lowest cost and the highest volumes. And um, 
this is a this is a map basically of uh, international shipping. Um, and one of the reasons I find endless inspiration in the natural world is because biology doesn't ever start from scratch. Um, this is a treatise on design from a designer that I really like. And she says that cultural and historical awareness are woven into the DNA of worthwhile products. Um, and in biology, you return over and over again to the same solutions um, in response to problems in the environment. So, Futurecraft is um, what I'm helping to shape at Adidas. And uh, currently, it's a series of experiments and, and speculations into what technology could be. Um, and if we wanted to, if we could add emotion and expression to materials and processes in order to create meaning. So the three tenets of Futurecraft that are really important to me are that it's uh, born from culture. It's the number one. It's not just technology for technology's sake, because we haven't done it before. It's built for purpose, it serves a function, and it's simple. Why do we send things halfway across the world and then send them all the way back? So this was a, a sort of uh, framework in which I sort of started to think about Futurecraft um, and what it could be and how we think about materials and processes and how we pair them together. Um, so there's craft, there's future, there's material, there's process. What happens if you start connecting the dots? So this is a picture of lace making and embroidery. Um, these are both uh, processes of making that are born from culture. Um, and this is um, a quick video of a machine that we borrowed from the um, automotive industry. That's an embroidery machine. It's called Tailored Fiber. Um, they actually used it to place uh, seating coils into cars. But here we're using it to think about additive manufacturing um, that's not knit in a different way. So right now it's embroidering, um, just laying down one, one single piece of material and then tacking it down. Um, and it's in doing this onto a dissolvable chem sheet. Sorry. So what this technology allows us to do, um, much like 3D printing, is place specific fibers um, onto a dissolvable sheet. And um, we can create something that looks almost like technological lace. This is a um, prototype of a track spike that we were working on. Um, we can play with the fabric's orientation, the fiber orientation, um, its characteristics, and there's incredible potential for creating new uh, material composites. Um, but for me, the thing that was missing for this is that, one, it's not, I mean, it's daringly simple, it's additive manufacturing, but um, the materials that we're using didn't relate to culture. Um, and as you know, we live in the Anthropocene, um, and one of the biggest issues that we have is ocean plastic. 
Um, so every year, um, poachers lay down deep sea ocean plastic nets, uh, gill nets, to capture fish. Uh, this is illegal as of 1992, but they still do it. Um, and this is the Sea Shepherd. It's an anti-poaching vessel, um, and it intercepted a uh, poaching vessel that was called the Thunder um, in Antarctica. And over the course of um, 110 days, it followed the ship, and it pulled up all of the gill net that that ship was laying down back up on board. There was only almost 70 miles of it in total. And this is the captain of the ship. His name is uh, Sid, Captain Sid. Um, and from that gill net, that 70 miles of gill net, we processed um, the material and we extruded it into two monofilaments um, that we were able to then use in the TFP machine in order to create a shoe uh, that combined both recycled ocean plastic as well as the gill net material, which is the green that you see there. Um, and this was presented at uh, the United Nations uh, Earth Day. As you can see, the Captain Sid there is on the left, and a guy who um, runs an organization called Parlay for the Oceans, uh, Cyril, is on the right. Um, and this was the beginning of a commitment that we made to um, to a more sustainable future, to a daringly simple future where we use the materials that we already have and we've already created to create something new. Um, we also 3D printed with it to create an outsole. Um, and this is the first commercial release of the product. Um, in the heel, there's some gill net, and then the rest of the shoe is made out of 100% um, recycled ocean plastic. And by 2020, we want to have 100% um, of our knit footwear made out of recycled ocean plastic. So where are these knit shoes going to be made? Um, these ones that are made out of entirely ocean plastic. For years, the footwear industry has been producing things um, remotely in Asia. And um, Adidas has started a new initiative that's called, I don't like the name. It's called Speed Factory. Um, and the first test model for this, this factory has been opened in Germany. Um, and there's going to be another one opened in the US this year. The thing that I think is interesting about it is that what Adidas is providing are um, tools for 3D scanning your feet, for um, analyzing motion, analyzing the way that our bodies sweat and create heat, um, in order to create products that have a mass have the ability to be, have mass customization. Um, but for me, it's still technology for technology's sake, and it's not born from culture. Um, I think that in order to make the speed factory a relevant concept, we need to rethink the supply chain. Um, craft processes are grounded in, in a sense of place, and they've evolved from, from local natural resources and, and from specific needs. Um, this is a man named Lenny Teapot West. Uh, he's wearing a fisherman's Gansey. He wore this Gansey to his wedding. Um, and the, it's 100% wool. It's three-ply, um, seamless. It's, uh, it's built for purpose. Um, but it also carries these, these, this meaning, um, these symbols within it that denote culture and, and value to him. Um, Britain has more sheep than anywhere else in the world, more different breeds than anywhere else in the world. Could we um, tell a story about wool in the UK? Could we place a speed factory so that it was at the place of the means of, of uh, the, the material that was being produced? Um, I think that that would be a great example of future craft. Thanks.